26 seconds. That's not very much time, but it just, that's what it was. And he came home, he was in a trance-like state. He couldn't sit still or stand still. He was pacing constantly. So that was, it was really scary for me. And a lot of these things are written here and I can't read, so. <laughs> I'm getting there. He was constantly second guessing himself. And he just never did that before. He was always one that could just talk and he was fine. Um, I'm just gonna have to read this a little bit. This was very scary for me because all of a sudden it was me that was gonna be in charge. And I'm not the in charge person. I'm the person that sort of helps other people rather than me being the one taking the leadership role. So this was a big change for us or for me. And I really didn't know what to do. And it just, I didn't know where to go or, or who to even call. I wasn't ashamed of him. I was very proud of him because he was doing his job. But still, there's such a, a stigma attached to it that I just sort of was uncomfortable with a lot of it. So I thought I will be the one that's going to take charge and see if I can make him get better. Um, so what I did was I, I've got to get this in order again. Because he couldn't concentrate, a lot of emotions were just like in a roller coaster. He was just going back and forth, back and forth, and just not able to, to do any concentrations. I know I'm repeating myself. And he found it hard with our two young boys. They were just four and five at the time, so there was a lot of uncomfortable times because they didn't know what was wrong with Dad. I didn't know either. But we just sort of kept going, getting things done. One time he came home, he went back to work shortly after, and he hid everything. And a lot of people said, oh, Sid is just great, he's so fine. Look at him, you know, he did the best job he could, he's a hero, that type of thing, at home. He wasn't feeling like a hero. At work they said, oh, just have a few drinks, get over it, it'll be fine. He came home, he took a few things. If that didn't work, he didn't get over it. So for me, it was very scary. I mean, we all have a few drinks and, and you're able to, to cope with it. But he was drinking way too much and not able to cope with it. And yet he kept going to work. I don't know how he went to work, but he did. And his armor was his police uniform. And in the police uniform, when he had that on, he was great. He could go up through all his, his full day and not have to worry about it. But when he came home, he would almost bring the uniform with him, even though he wasn't wearing the uniform. He was still a police officer. And when he came home, we needed a dad, a spouse. We didn't need a police officer in the house. Um, this is getting a little easier. <laughs> he would lose his temper quite often and just walk away. And he, when he did that, he would go and sit in the rocking chair and just rock and rock. And I figured, you know, what's going on? I wasn't sure how to deal with it. But it seemed that when he was doing that, he was actually talking to himself and getting things out and trying to figure things out. And that seemed to calm him down. But then all of a sudden, the radio would come on with a, a bulletin or the newspaper with all these pictures of him. And this was going all across Canada. So then I get a phone call from my mother, like, your husband shot somebody? What's wrong with him? He was doing his job, Mom. The people are calling him a killer. <coughs> he's not a killer, he's doing his job. This was scary for her, because the neighbors back in Nova Scotia thought there was something wrong with her son-in-law, because he was supposed to be the perfect guy. He was still the perfect guy, but in their eyes, they were seeing the killer. And I lost my train of thought again. 
since this BTS came home, I figured I've got to do a schedule because my husband had lost all his confidence. Now with him speaking today, you would never know that. But he just couldn't make one decision. I'd put out some clothes or something and I'd say, you know, you got to change, we're going someplace. He would just stand and look at the clothes. And I'd say, okay, let's go one, two, three. That's what you'll wear, we'll put this away. So simple. But when you can't do it, you can't do it. And trying to decide what to eat or to what to do. One day he came home from work and uh, I said, um, I thought I was being nice. I said, would you like fish or chicken for supper? Now he's not a fish lover by any means, but he'd always eat whatever I made. And he looked at me and he says, the last time I made a decision, I killed someone. And now you're asking me to make another decision? Well, the supper was very quiet. And we didn't have fish, we had chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so we just ate, the boys ate, because they were very young, they weren't sure what was going on. I said, just eat, doesn't matter what it is, just eat it. We got the dishes done, they had the baths, and they were off to bed. And then Dave and I tried to deal with things. And one night, um, it was very uncomfortable, but all we did was sit on the couch and just sit beside each other. And we, didn't have, we don't have to say anything. We just know the other person's there. And that has a lot of strength. But it takes a lot of guts to do it, because I'm a chatterbox once I get going, so I had to be very quiet. Um, Okay. Um, besides taking care of two young boys who were very rambunctious and always on the go, I, had, I now had an adult child living with me. So we had to start back at the beginning, little steps, constantly trying to, to make things work. I informed the, the boys' teachers about all the uh, events going on in our family, just so that they would be aware. Because in our village, um, the boys just walked to school, but the teachers were from all outside. There weren't many from the village, so they didn't know. They weren't aware of who it was. So I, I tried to take care of that. And I wanted to take care of myself, but I was sort of way down on the totem pole. So my time was between 2 and 3 in the morning because usually the boys were always sleeping through. That was no problem. But Sid was sort of go to, go to bed, go to sleep, and he'd be up in about 10 minutes walking, pacing, going back and forth. And so finally I figured out between 2 and 3 he's going to sleep. So I could be up and I was out sitting on my doorstep. So that was where I was safest and was most comfortable. And um, that gave me a little bit of time for myself. And then, um, quite often, Sid didn't realize this, but because of the pacing, I would just get him dressed and we'd go out, and he thought he was walking all around the village, which is not a big village, but big enough. But what we were doing was walking around our yard, and we would just walk around the yard. I had the windows open so I could hear the boys in case they woke up. And because um, we didn't have any babysitters that I could call at 4 o'clock in the morning, come on over, watch my kids. Mm -hmm. Nobody here's going to volunteer. Mm -hmm. And nobody back then did either. So um, we managed to, to get through it. And I'm a great believer in, in helping. So it worked. That's good enough. Um, and I, uh, I was not ashamed. I was very proud. And <laughs> so I, uh, I didn't hide. I went out where people were, like you guys. And, we, and I just acted as if everything was normal, because that was the best way to do it. Because uh, we had our voice in all kinds of sports, so they went. And the big thing was mom was always there. But dad showed up once or twice, and he was the hero. 
which worked out fine because they saw that and they knew dad was hurting but they could see that dad was improving and that was getting better and better and he was connecting with them more and that's so important no matter what age your kids are you've got to connect with them and it's kind of hard sometimes because they sometimes turn into little brats but we <laughs> just keep going <laughs>
just like my dad, but I'm the one that says, we'll do this and this and this, and we get it together and we eat and we're still living. <laughs> I think my time's up and I'm ready to go. So thank you for listening to me. Therefore, there's no cookie-cutter approach to treatment of the individual. 
but a structured, individualized treatment plan is required by psychologists, the psychiatrists, the team, usually the primary caregivers, the doctor. I find that usually he doesn't di do the diagnosis. He doesn't put the pieces together. He'll treat each individual thing. So you really need to seek out the help of the psychologist. And we need someone that will take into the account the variables in one's life for the pacing of treatment. Family and peers may see somebody that's struggling, but some will not. Sometimes the change occurs slowly over time, and even the person affected won't realize what's happening to them. As we know, PTS is a normal reaction to an abnormal event. And we know that if helps receive quickly, we can alleviate the symptoms. The normal symptoms that eventually left untreated evolve into PTS. So why is help not received? Why isn't it sought out sooner by these people? By your loved one, by your employees, by your, by your husband. It's like a frog in a pot of cold water. If you were to place a frog in a pot of hot pot, what would happen? The frog would jump out, right? But if you place the frog in a cold pot and slowly turn up the temperature, the frog's not going to jump out. It's going to adapt to the change. And then eventually they're boiled in that pot. This is what happened to my husband. He was shot in 1990 in Jane of Finch area when he worked for Toronto Police Association, sorry, Toronto Police Service. And he was diagnosed subsequently in 1993 by WSIB. Was he treated? No. That may be shocking to some of you, but that was quite common back then. And we've all heard the suck it up buttercup saying. And being that young police officer that wants to be on the job, my husband wasn't going to buy into the diagnosis. So he didn't seek treatment himself. What he did to the politics of the time, he left that service and went to work for another one. Months after having his hand shot, he was back in the, in the harness, as they say, with a holster. I don't know how he did it, having flashbacks, and dealing with the change, just the change of the workplace, the change of residence, moving from Toronto to Owen Sound, having a young child. But I see this frog in the pot often is the case with somebody with cumulative and chronic post-traumatic stress. The person struggling might know that there's something wrong with them, but they might not know what it is. They might be struggling with shame and guilt or self-stigma. Fellow employees or supervisors can't understand post-traumatic stress often because they don't have it. It's an injury to the brain, and therefore it's unseen as far as injuries go. Think of it as a circuit breaker. It's been switched. And that switch has disrupted the emotional flow but it can definitely be seen in the many symptoms that I previously mentioned. Often the workplace will blame the symptoms on family issues. We hear this all the time. And the family will blame the workplace. Both the workplace and the family unit are an integral part of a person's recovery. We need both the workplace and the family to be proactive when it comes to recognizing the symptoms and we need the responder to be educated themselves about post-traumatic stress. Family's a major piece to the recovery puzzle in the healing journal, journey. We know that the chronicity of post-traumatic stress is related to the lack of supports, the lack of support from the workplace, from the family at times, the lack of resources. We just live three hours north of here and you can't get a psychologist that has trauma training that doesn't have a closed practice. Lack of support by the workplace. 
How do you understand the anxiety, the confusion, the uncertainty that Judy talked about that comes with the overwhelming need within that family unit? Where's the resources for family? Spouses and children are an important part, important piece of the puzzle that often get overlooked. There's a real disruption of family, as Judy mentioned, and I could give you examples myself, that occurs. And I can tell you the one piece that helps the most is education. Education goes a long way in assisting the family. But you're not the identified client, so you're often put off. We need to foster a community of support starting at the home and involving the workplace. So with Bill and I, we have no outside family. We have four children. The oldest is in the military. He doesn't talk to us anymore. We have three others that we're involved with as much as possible to living at home. The extended family, they're not there. They never called when I had my shooting incident to find out anything. I spoke recently 15 minutes away from one of my family members, my close family members in the family tree. They didn't want to come. They were too busy. So what do you do when you don't have that kind of support? Bill's first marriage dissipated because of the PTS and the related issues. And that was a huge disruption in his immediate family. So he lost the support of his siblings, except for his mother, but now she's been passed away for a number of years. So where do you find the support as a family member when you're in that situation? How do you help your spouse regain their equilibrium? Your family and yourself regain their equilibrium and the after effects of trauma. Judy touched on a few self-care, outside professionals, quality relationships. We've heard that from several speakers. We need the affirmation and validation by administration. We need spousal support. Then there's exercise, good nutrition, hobbies, enjoyable activities, relaxation, and spirituality. I can tell you that uh, things were more balanced for Bill and I in a period of time. And he had a reoccurrence in 2014. He had four really serious shooting incidences in a row in Owen Sound. And that just triggered everything. And his body shut down. So he had inflammation in all the sites that he had been shown. He still had shrapnel within his body. And those sites were acting up as well. So he went to the family doctor. He thought he'd be back to work in December. This was October. He went to see the doctor, sent him to a hand specialist, sent him to a knee specialist, sent him to a back specialist. Sent him for every test you can get but an MRI, because an MRI might kill him. No reason for the, for the information. No textbook that they could open and say, this is what's wrong with you. So as a spouse, I finally clued in, it's his PTSD. He's been diagnosed, never treated, and this is what we're looking at again. So I had to go to the family doctor with him and say, look, somebody has to connect the dots. And then as Dr. Jonathan mentioned, assessment after assessment after assessment after assessment happened with no treatment for months. So during that time, of course, my life got very disrupted. The family home got very disrupted. I um, was doing hospice care. I gave that up, that volunteer work. I had to be at home to care for my husband. I cut back on my social activities that I was involved with because I just couldn't do everything and maintain the balance. That's Judy. <laughs> That's a hundred pound ball. <laughs> How many can lift that? I <laughs> That's four turkeys. It's almost like something. <laughs> the ripple effect.
impact on the family? Depression, anger, withdrawal, anxiety, embarrassment, grief, numbing, avoidance, guilt, shame, health problems, chronic pain, they become part of your family household. PTSD often hurts the relationships that are the most important. Living with someone who is easily started, startled, has nightmares, and avoids social situations takes a toll on the most caring family and the closest relationships. You are never in it alone. When PTSD affects you, it affects everyone around you. Recently, our oldest daughter, that's my stepdaughter, was comfortable enough to say, because Dad's further along in his healing journey, that Dad looked dead for the last four years. And to me, it's with cumulative trauma, it's like every trauma that you get involved with shaves a bit of your soul away. And you can be left empty. And I think that's what she was seeing in the world. There's also the ripple effect. We've read stories now on Holocaust <coughs> uh, survivors because we've had a couple generations and they've been a good base to do research on that trauma doesn't always dissipate in its effects, but it can trickle down from generation to generation. So that is a huge concern for Bill and I because we both had PTSD and we had children. So we went out and sought help for our children so that we could understand why is dad always angry at me? Why is mom always on edge or whatever it was? We wanted someone outside our immediate family to be able to talk to them. And, uh, that is something that I would recommend if you happen to be in a situation like that. Grief and loss. This is something that this year I have really been struggling with. There's the grief that I hear all the time of the partner I want to meet, the husband I want to meet. I belong to a spousal support group through the Operational Stress Injury Support Services, and is they're now starting to open up to first responders, and we were accepted last year into their fold. And it's the one place I can go and talk to the other wives and not have to explain anything, and I'm not judged, because they're going through the same thing. But I hear them often say they've come home from work, and nothing's done in the house, it's a mess. Supper's not ready. Their husband's been home all day. He can't remember to take his medications. He can't remember his appointments. And he can't make family decisions. And they're just waiting for their husband to get back to normal. I can tell you that there is no normal to get back to. I would tell you that there's a new normal. But you really have to work on that. But there's a grief around that person that you marry is no longer the person that you're married to, and you touched on that as well. There's also the loss of the family that you once knew. Think of the police family. My husband has dedicated almost 30 years to Toronto Police Service, Owen Sound Police Service. He goes off work October 2014. Nobody called. Nobody came to the door. I finally reached out in January to one of his good friends and said, look, like, it would be really helpful if somebody came by and just took him out. He doesn't drink coffee, but take him out for coffee for a second. Take him out for lunch. You call him and say, how, how are you doing? And there was a couple people that did that for a couple months and then that dropped off. And I get it, they're busy. They're, they're busy in the police culture. They're working on surviving themselves. They're working on moving up the ladder. They're busy with their families, balancing work and family life. But we're forgotten. And that's a huge loss when you've been a part of that family for so long. And then there's the extended family, which I spoke about too, and Judy mentioned too, the stigma that happens. You know, why don't they get more involved? their daughter shot somebody, 
they don't even call to see how their daughter is because they don't want to be wrapped up in that stigma. There's also the loss of the parent that you were. I know my husband is very, has a very difficult time with this. All the years that he couldn't be there for his two younger children and the resulting loss of a relationship with the oldest boys. Luckily, with his oldest daughter, he's been able to forge that relationship again. With his oldest son, I don't know if that will ever happen. And it is what it is. There's loss and grief with the life that you knew or you dreamed of. We had a farm. It was a huge part of my healing process. I had flower gardens. I had uh, heritage chickens. We basically hobby farmed, but homesteaded. And I homeschooled for five years as well. That was a huge part of my world and my healing process. But then when Bill was off in 2014 and fighting for WSIB, he was denied three times. Although he had been shot in 1990 and diagnosed by WSIB, they would not recognize the cumulative trauma over those 25 years. They finally looked at the 1990 shooting and said, like a deck of cards, I was to put out all these traumas. The 1991 is the trump. It trumps all these others. So we're going back to 1990, and you will receive a portion of your 1990 wage. He didn't even have children then. Now he has four, and his oldest daughter was in university. I wasn't working because I was punching off with WSIB for my own shooting incident and my diagnosis. So we made an executive move. It was more my decision because my husband wasn't really able to make those types of decisions at the time that we needed to downsize. So we sold the farm, did most of the packing myself. The children didn't want to help because they didn't want to move, they didn't want to leave. That was the only one they know. And we moved to a small village. In the long run, it's going to be a good decision. But I can tell you, I was never quite sure if I was making the right decision because I didn't want it to backfire and us to separate because we made this decision thinking it was the best and then everybody was angry and upset about it and the loss of the farm. So spousal support is draining, draining physically. I, I was telling a few people that I've actually gained 40 pounds. I'm working on losing that. I'm finally at the point where I can start working on myself and I've dropped 10 pounds. But I couldn't do everything. I couldn't look after everything and look after myself. And I had to be okay with that. When I'm in a place where I can look after myself better, that will happen. Right now, I've got all these crises happening that I have to do with. <coughs> so it's psychologically draining as well. Socially and spiritually, the potential for burnout and passion fatigue is high. And then there's the secondary traumatization. So with Bill and I, it's a little bit different. I don't know of any other couple in the policing world, at least, we haven't met, that have been both involved in the shooting as and both have PTS. But I'm sure there's, there's going to be more couples, especially in the military, where you'll see that couple like that. So if Bill's got a hand grenade on himself that day, there's the risk that he's going to throw it over me, and I hang on to it for a while, and then I throw it back to him. So it's something that we have to be aware of and work on because our situation is like that. And sometimes we do throw the hand grenade back and forth. It's pretty hard to be in a house with depression and not be affected by it. <coughs> So yesterday, after we set up here for two hours, I had booked an appointment with the float therapy, which was the best decision, best decision that I made yesterday. And after the float therapy, which I have to tell you, if you have never tried it, it's a must do. 
because I have chronic pain in my neck, shoulders. I never really relax. My husband, he has a trigger at 1.15 in the morning. That's when he got shot. He wakes up gasping and moving around like he's back on the pavement. My trigger is 3.11 when I was called in in front of the chief. Uh, my shooting incident happened at 10.30, but they kept me working. Finally called me in at 3.11 to stand before the chief where they asked for a duty statement. And it hit me. What the hell have I done now? So that's my, my little time. And then Bill has another one at 4.30. So when we were younger, we used to have some sleepless nights. <laughs> Sorry, Jen. <laughs> now we have some sleepless nights. <laughs> for different reasons. So it was funny, because after that float therapy session, we got in the car, and I was like, whatever for today, right? Because I was so relaxed. Today's going to go fine. Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And I logged into my email, and I had been sent this message. Dearest Lynn, what if I told you that every challenge you had in your life is meant to turn you into a shining glory for others? Even if you can't see it now, even if life looks bleak and filled with never-ending struggles, there is a divine reason. A divine reason that can be used or will be used to turn your life into a magnificent diamond. Do not lose heart. You are the unsinkable limb, for no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I was like, wow. I just was in a hot tub, or a, sorry, it's not a hot tub, a flow therapy pod full of Epsom salts, so I was truly unsinkable. <laughs> and I'm sharing that with you because in my life, I grew up in a very dysfunctional, abusive home. And that's why I got into police work. I was very good at being the mediator, being the parent, deflecting domestics, getting the beer ball uh, bouncing off me. And I went into police work. I was also a casualty of several sexual assaults. I lost a baby with Bill. We almost lost Jenna when she was 13 years old. My first week policing, I went to three suicides. And I saw how tragic it was for the, the young boy that was left behind. And his father was trying to get back to him. It was a marital breakup. I went to an autopsy. And I continued on in that policing role until my shooting incident, which was the straw that broke this kind of box, so to speak. And I'm sharing that with you because I know everyone in this room has a story, maybe very similar to mine. And I want you to know that you are unsinkable, that you are a diamond in the rough, that you can, and many of you are, making the changes that we need, supporting others, mm -hmm. caring. If you weren't here, I know you wouldn't care. And that's where it starts. So even though I got this email, it went out to like hundreds of others, right? But it was very fitting and very timely. So how do you stay afloat? And I'm going to go through this quickly. It depends where you are in your journey with your spouse. Are you in crisis? Are you learning to cope? Or are you moving into advocacy? Those are the three. If you're in crisis with your spouse, you don't have time to go to the gym and worry about your figure. You're dealing with other things. So you need to acknowledge the trauma, the trauma that's happened with your spouse. You need to gain awareness through education, any avenue you can. Badger Life Canada. There are others out there as well, but that's why we started Badger Life Canada. Because we want to be that resource hub where someone's in crisis, they can go and find that stuff. I had to go find my own psychologist and my own lawyer with assistance with my husband, not from my association or my workplace after my shooting incident. Why should someone have to do that when they're in a state of shock? 
When survivors are able to accept and grow from their pain, love for their partner can actually intensify. You need to feel, this is something that policing and probably other public service workers find it difficult to do because we have that switch. But we need to process what happened. We need to be vulnerable. We need to learn how to be vulnerable if we're not. Because we can't be authentic without being that. We need to process what happened, how it's affecting yourself, your spouse, and your family. Learning to cope is the second stage. Learning to cope with the anger, the guilt, the resentment, the shame, the grief, the sorrow, the exhaustion, the frustration, the isolation, and the depression. Respect the pain and feelings that come up. Seek help for yourself. Seek peer support if it's available. There are special support groups. And if anybody in this room is looking for something like that, that's that's part of my role at Magic Life County. I have lots of people that reach out to me and I try to make these connections for them. Attend psychologist appointments with your spouse. I know Bill's actually encourages that every six to eight weeks. It gives them a sense of what's going on in the home and whether their client is being authentic in session. Learn as much as you can about trauma or the comorbid conditions that are affecting your spouse. Educate yourself, your children, sometimes even your community. My husband has a service dog. I don't know how many police officers are in the room or paramedics, but you know when you, you've been off for a while and you get back behind the harness and everybody starts waving at you? You're like, first you're like, what are they looking at? And then you realize, oh yeah, I'm in a police group. You're in that fishbowl, right? Well, you're very much in a fishbowl when you have a service dog. And there's days where you don't want that person coming up to you asking you why you have that service in there. What's wrong with you? You look big and strong. So as a spouse, sometimes I have to advocate for him in that role as well. And in, in turn, educate the community. And then moving into advocacy, looking for opportunities in your community, opportunities to practice self-care, mind, body, and spirit, balancing work and your home stressors, seeking healing connections. We've talked about some today. Yoga, unfortunately that lady couldn't come. I joined a drumming group and I, I went to about three and then there was two members that started fighting in a group after I'd been there. What am I doing here? So you need to find positive places to go. Avoid the negativity. I actually approached a yoga instructor and asked her if she would start a class for PTSD. People suffering PTSD and she said yes. And we've been going for about a year and a half now. And there's some men in that class that would never have gone to a normal class with women in tights, right? So it's, they were hooked, those men were hooked after one session. Advocate, speak out. Help yourself and help others. Be the difference that you want to see in the world. That's the ripple effect that I'm talking about. And it takes time, and it takes time for the transformation. You can rebuild your transformed relationship, but it's an ongoing process. Everyone is changing every day. Just like a normal married couple, you're not the same that you were when you first got married, 20 years later. But you didn't have that catapult of trauma that occurred with those of us that have had that in our life. And I like to think of it as the lifeline. Most people, you know, they're going along as children and then something really good happens and then maybe something really bad happens and it continues on kind of like this. The best way I can describe personally PTSD when my life went like this, and then it started going like this, backwards. And I was stuck there. I felt like the day of that shooting incident, that few minutes, that I couldn't get out of it. I was in that for a long time. But with help and with support, you can start moving this way. 
And the thought process is that even though we may be in this cycle for a while, and you know, you get that letter from the insurance company, and you sit down and read it, and you start going this way again. The hope is, with help, that you don't keep going backwards. And that when you do go backwards, you don't go back as far as you did before. And that when you do go backwards, you don't stay there as long as you did before, before you start moving forward. I'm just going to leave it at that. I, I wanted to ask one thing to see if you guys were listening. If fish aren't thirsty, what else are they? Remember my email? What was the word? Sinking. Who said it? Unsinkable. You're unsinkable. And you can be unsinkable too. You just need the help and support of others. That water, that um, Epsom salt that I was that I was in was keeping me buoyant. I wasn't doing it by myself. It was just an analogy to, to reach out to others. Everybody in this room cares, so please reach out. Thank you so much.
lacerations on his body. And he was my patient. And I was taking care of him. And on the way to the hospital, I found out he was also the murderer. So there began my journey with, in a roundabout way, a moral injury. I had to take care of this gentleman who very, you know, mental health illness or not, um, did perform this horrendous act to these two women. And I, I had to take care of him. That's what I had to do. But also I was looking into the face of evil and I'd never seen that before. That sensation of walking into the hotel and knowing something was wrong, that was that sensation. And my view of humanity definitely changed. So even though I did have other calls in my career that I can tell you cumulatively made me sick as well, uh, after that call, it, I started to spiral out of control. But I would mask it with alcohol, drugs, um, mostly alcohol. And uh, in 2014, I needed to testify. And when I testified, that was a trigger, seeing this patient, his name's Mark Dobson, the murderer, and um, I got very, very sick. So after that, I went through three overdoses and one very serious suicide attempt. I was so sick with drugs and alcohol, I had my son taken away from me by CAS. Multiple hospital stays in the mental health a unit of RBH and Barry. I did outpatient um, programs with RBH, but I was so fortunate and I was so happy to see Dr. Vitalago today that um, after a little bit of a wait, I made it into Homewood. So I was there for seven weeks in the PTSD and addiction program, and it saved my life. And one of the main things that definitely saved me <coughs> was having peer support. It was the very first time that I was actually in a room just like Dr. Vidalago and Wendy were saying, that they would bring uh, first responders into a separate, separate room, and you definitely just can relate to one another. I felt, for the very first time, like I wasn't alone. I'd been hiding behind a wall of just illusions for years. So this peer support, um, like I said, it saved my life. So while I was at Homewood, I, I definitely discovered I was an alcoholic and an addict and I um, started that journey. But when I got home, I found that I was really still lost, and I didn't have the same support that I had when I was at Homewood. Like even looking at that picture when I saw it, I miss Homewood. It's a, it's a very weird feeling. I hated it when I first went there, and then I missed it because it's really where I got better. And I wanted to bring some of that back home with me. And there really wasn't anything that was offered in this form of peer support. So at that time, I was still in my early stages of recovery. I reached out to Bill Rusk and just kind of said what I was looking to do. And then I also put on Facebook a call out for any first responders, military members, healthcare professionals to form a focus group with me to make a peer support group. And Bill had heard this and he said, well, wait a second, Natalie, don't reinvent the wheel. You need to call Sid Gravel because he's definitely an expert in this field. So Sid didn't know me from anywhere, and luckily we over Facebook, um, he got to know me a bit, and he said, read my book, 56 Seconds. It tells you about the peer support team that I have created many years ago, and it's very successful. And I did, and I took it, and we went back to this focus group of 14 people, and we modified it so that it would work for any first responder, healthcare provider, um, anyone basically in the circle of care. We keep on adding different um, careers into that. So together we call it Wings of Change. So our mission, quite simply, is that we encourage a new outlook where the need for all first responders, military members, healthcare professionals, corrections workers and communications op officers don't need to feel comfortable with uncomfortable any longer. And that's the way I used to term how I felt. I felt like I was being forced to be comfortable with uncomfortable. And I just didn't know how to manage that. So this is basically what I'm showing you is a model that um, I'm going to give you the contact information at the end of, this, at the, end of the presentation, which is going to be very quick. And um, it's a free model that I will send to you. You get this presentation. 
as well as a hard copy of, so I'm a first responder and I wanted to have some kind of a peer support group, then I will send you the model and it will tell you step by step how to have this type of peer support group in whatever community or um, service you are with. So the focus of this um, group though is that we want to make sure that it's anonymous and solution based. So that's our discussion. We don't talk about war stories. Um, that's for the professionals to manage. We sit around and we bring up topics about how to heal. Um, we talk about our struggles in our family life and those types of things and that leads to our solution based discussion. And the other thing is that it was really important to us because it's peer solution only, that yes, an employer may uh, give information about where, they, where you can find a meeting, but no employer is directly affiliated with Wayne's Change. And that was really important because there's definitely a line that many employees don't want to cross with the employer being in charge of any type of support. So we separated it and this is strictly just for peers. So where can these meetings happen? It can be anywhere. So we're, I'm lucky enough in Barrie that uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association director offered me the boardroom that um, exists there. And we have a meeting the first Tuesday of every month in Barrie, and it's for an hour. But you can have it anywhere. If you have the model and the copy in front of you, you can have it in your basement if that's what you felt like having it. Um, but it is also, all the meetings that we do uh, actually set up will be provided on the Canadian Mental Health Association website, as well as the Badge of Life Canada website. So we're really happy about that. So today we have, um, we just started, I'm trying to go so fast, and I need to like, okay, now they agree. Um, so we just officially launched February of this year. So, and um, the Barry chapter is growing quite well. We have a lot of regular, um, members attend and one of our focus group members Marcel Martel who is in the orange I've got your back shirt right back there sorry I'm pointing you out because I want to um, he's starting a North Bay chapter which is really exciting he's from North Bay and he would drive to Barry every month to come into to our meeting and it would it was that effective for him that he's making one in North Bay thank you Marcel So like I said, it's completely flexible. You pick when, where, doesn't matter. You get to adapt to whatever your schedule is and when you can have these meetings. So why was it created? I've already told you. I needed the peer support beyond Homewood. So where did we get the inspiration of the owl? So again, as a focus group, we had no name, we had no mascot, and one of our members had the idea of using an owl and it because, it's because it represents strength and wisdom, and these creatures navigate through the night, and so we kind of match that with the darkness that we navigate through, through our, our OSI, and et cetera. So this is just a quick rundown of the beautiful focus group members that we have. So today we do have Marcel Martel, who's a paramedic, and we also have Lindsay Parasani at the back beside Marcel. And they have worked with me through this entire time, as well as the names that you guys up, uh, can see up here. I'm not gonna read them all. But we had members from Alberta and BC as well, and we just Skyped. It was not fun learning how to, <laughs> right, Marcel? <laughs> anyway, um, we figured it out, and it was great. It was nice for the people out there to be able to interact as well. So like I said, it's peer focused. Um, some of the key things is that it's only facilitated by peers. You don't need a diagnosis of a mental health injury at all. Um, and individuals are welcome to come. They can just sit and listen or they can participate. It's totally up to them. And sometimes we find that that is a progression. They'll come and just sit and listen to kind of get you know, a taste of what's going on and then participate maybe the next time. So anonymity is huge for us. Um, call myself the anonymity queen. I've, had, I've been blessed to have many people open up to me and, and share their stories and it's so important to me as well when I didn't want to talk. It's up to the individual to choose when they want to speak. So in the room, everything that we say in the room stays in the room. 
and that's 100% a rule with us. The other thing is that because it's peer-led and peer support, and we aren't um, professionals in giving mental health advice, etc., is that um, we also have crisis intervention um, resources at every meeting as well. So like I said, you, um, if you request a model, you'll get a chairperson's guide. So say I'm, I asked for a model, it will literally tell me if I set up a meeting with two of my peers, I follow step by step by step how to go through this meeting and it's really quite self-explanatory. So here we have Sid. So you guys have got a chance to meet Sid, which is great. And like we said, um, Wings of Change is adapted from Robin's Blue Circle, um, which is a very successful peer support uh, team. So again, I was very grateful that I got um, paired up with Sid so that I didn't have to reinvent the wheel and that it is very successful already. And like you know, he is, uh, he's helped hundreds of people across Canada and around the world, really. So the things that we um, run our meeting on are from um, Sid's book, The 56 Seconds. And so we have these readings, preliminary readings, just at the very beginning of the meeting. And the three of those meetings, uh, sorry, readings are, one is the four rules. So we talk quickly about that we claim no qualifications other than that we've just personally experienced traumatic events. We aren't professionals. Um, we have to obviously say that concurrently, you should, you should definitely seek professional help. And we definitely make sure that confidentiality is number one. We don't take attendance, we don't do case reports. Everything that you say in the room is left in the room, and that's it. Five stages of healing, we just quickly read that as well. And the reason why we read this every single meeting is that for the people that are new, that maybe don't even know if they belong there. What we find is once they start to hear the points that we're saying, generally speaking, they are reassured that, unfortunately, they may belong there. So every time we have a meeting, these things are, are discussed each time. And the other uh, reading is the eight common symptoms. So we go through this, just list them off. And I know that that's what helped me when I was in Homewood, especially when I realized that I was an alcoholic. You know, they were going through checklists of things and I was just like, wow, okay, I met every single one of those things. How can I pretend that I don't have this? So it really did help me a lot. So then after the readings that we do, um, I have this paper, we pass around paper and everybody writes down, if you want, if not, you don't have to, a topic, topic that you'd like to discuss. So here are some examples and those are provided as well with the package. So some specific things that I address um, in the uh, chairperson's guide is that we don't have crosstalk in the meeting. So right now the meetings are quite small. We have I think eight maybe members was the biggest we've had in Barrie so far. And it's an hour and we just mentioned that there's no crosstalk which means that we don't interrupt or respond directly or indirectly to another person's comments. And that is because, number one, time-wise, we want people to be able to have an opportunity to share if they want to. And number two, um, and again, I learned this in Homewood, was if I feel like I'm potentially going to have a comment back to me after I share, I'm less likely to share. So we encourage discussion about whatever topic or beyond after the meeting. But um, when it's your time to share, it's, you get to sit and share and that's it and you say you're ready to pass and then you pass and then people would ask well how would we know if people are understanding what you're saying or whatever no. and again this is from homewood i can promise you that when you're sitting in a room filled with people that completely understand where you've come from you will get eye contact you will get tears you will get a lot of head nods you will get smiles the body language that we were talking about before is confirmation for sure that you're not alone. So words, they're great for after the meeting. Our long-term goals, are, of, course, of course, are to have wings of change around the world. Um, I definitely have, have sent out dozens of the model um, after we launched in February. 
And again, it's, it's just going to take some time, I think, for people to know what it is or to understand how to run the meeting, etc. Research opportunities, uh, absolutely. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Donnelly from Windsor University, uh, I'm friends with, and we've discussed some future opportunities with research. And again, this is still pretty preliminary, but I'm very interested in that as well. And how will the successful or unsuccessful results be measured? So what we do is after we send out the model, three months later, I do an email follow-up. And I just say, you know, is there anything else I can help you with? I also offer to do Skype um, meetings if there's if people are nervous about doing the first meeting themselves. And I've had some great feedback as well. Unfortunately, a lot of the um, hesitation comes from uh, just being the first person to be vulnerable enough to do it. You know, you're you're putting yourself out there. If you're not an actual service that's, uh, you know told they need to have your support team and you're just a peer, well, if you haven't shared that you have some type of concern with your you know, mental health or whatever, then that's you're putting your foot out there. So again, with education and conferences like this, that's what's gonna help get the word out and give people the courage to be able to start these programs. Okay, and this is the last thing. <laughs> So contact information, so you can email me at paramedicnat at hotmail.com. And like I said, I will send you this presentation as well as the actual model. Um, there's some links here as well to Badge of Life. You can look, you can just Google 56 seconds and find Sid's book. I also have a blog, which is a really long name, so that's fine. And <laughs> I'm gonna go to the last thing. And that's me. So, thank you so much. <laughs> if you have any questions, just email me. I know I breezed through it, and thank you for your patience, and I'm done. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to share with you today. Thank you very much for your patience today and, and all that we had to share with you. When I wrote 56 Seconds years ago about the story of Robin's Blue Circle, founded in 1988, I hoped that the younger generation would take the book and take from it what they needed to move forward. And uh, Natalie has given me hope that people will take what some of us old fellows did way back in 1988 and make it fit for what they need today. I'm very proud of Natalie and her work, uh, Wings of Change, and I really hope uh, more people take up that kind of, a, 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 of a, a position in terms of moving forward. On behalf of Agile Life Canada, Bill Russ, Lynn Russ, um, Gary Ruby, Natalie, uh, Judy, and uh, Brad, our advisor, and some of the therapists here today who are listed on our website, thank you very much for being here today. I hope we've given you a lot of information that you need. I also hope that we've validated in your mind why we need to continue to exist. Thank you very much.